Good good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome to April when the sun is out and uh, we're here to talk about food. So hopefully you either had lunch or you're gonna go to lunch afterward because we're gonna make you hungry. So welcome to all of you. I'm Terry Emma, the director here at the Geneva History Museum. And we've had such a great two months so far of this wonderful exhibit on the Viking ship. If you haven't seen it yet, I really encourage you after today's program to hop in next door here through the hallway and check out this great exhibit called Vikings Voyage. And we're gonna have a fun May coming up as well. We'll have our final brown bag of the year, which uh, Heidi, our educator, will present about Geneva Vikings at the high school. So how the Vikings got their name, very interesting story that we learned, and also kind of the evolution of Viking mascot through Geneva. So uh, that, that'll be a fun program. And then we'll also have May as membership month. So that's a very exciting month around here. We encourage you to join if you're not a member of the museum. We also encourage you to renew and to help us at a time when donations are usually down at this, this time of year. So we really use all of your support. Most of the donations come at the end of the year. So this is kind of our mid-year and we celebrate what the museum does for the community and ask for all of you to help us out. So uh, we're also going to have a fun day at the Viking ship in May. On May 13th, you're going to be able to, if you're a member of the museum, to be able to take a tour of the ship for no cost. And um, you'll also be encouraged to become a member of the Friends of the Viking ship. So Dave will be there as well. So it is my honor to turn over this program to Dave Nordine, the Vice President of the Friends of the Viking Ship. He spent 35 years as a practicing attorney, he said. He was practicing for 35 years. <laughs> when was he ever gonna be one? I don't know, but uh, after 35 years, he decided he was done practicing. Uh, so he's been with the Friends of the Viking Ship since its formation, and he's very passionate and dedicated to the study and sharing of history, and you'll see that today in the program. We do have a few attending via Zoom, so welcome to all of you, and we will have question and answer at the end, and um, look forward to a great program. And I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and he has a very exciting announcement to make, and you guys are the first to hear it. Dave, I'm not going to take away your thunder, so I'm We'll do the exhibit already know. A part of the exhibit was a naming contest for the head and the tail. The name of the ship, of course, is the Viking. But what about the highly distinctive head and tail of the Viking ship? The parts of the ship that give it its personality. So we thought it'd be a great idea to have a naming contest for the head and tail. They never had a name before. There were over 182 entries. Some of them very, very clever, but choices had to be made. So right here and right now, I will announce the winner of the naming contest. Drum roll, please, on your desk. The name of the head and the tail is Praia. It is a true Viking name, the name of one of the most important Viking goddesses, the goddess of all good things. Love, beauty, attractiveness, fertility, and war. What's not to like? It is a pronounceable name in many languages. If you speak Spanish, you already know how to trill the R, Praia. If not, Fry is good enough. But anyway, henceforth, the head and tail, which comes with the head, be known as Praia. You're the first to know. Yes, F R E Y A. Yeah, more than one name. More than person suggested that name. Uh, Ken Selick and Marky, help me out. Susan Cleveland. We haven't even notified them yet. How that's before they do. Bye. Bye. All right. 
very, very much. Well, thank you very much for coming today. Um, this is the second in the presentations by friends of the Viking ship of specialized topics that go along with the exhibit we have on display, which goes along with the HMA Viking ship here in Geneva, where it's been for a quarter of a century. And uh, as you already know, that's why you're here at lunchtime today, that we're going to be talking about Viking food, a fascinating topic. Um, just as I announced last month, when we're talking about Viking women, our knowledge is limited. Uh, the Vikings did not publish any cookbooks, publish any books at all. Um, what they did do is tell stories. And food in these stories is often part of the backdrop that makes the story interesting. You know, details what makes things interesting. And when you're, making, you're telling a story, you add some details like food. And the stories, however, which we call today sagas, were composed for the entertainment of wealthy people. But the stories tend to be about wealthy people. Um, if you can add a little divinity into the story as well, explaining how the wealthy people you're talking to are probably certainly descended from gods, makes it even better. But the stories and the subject of the stories are selective because they're intended to appeal to the class of people who could afford to hire an entertainer at lavish dinners. And that's what survives to us today from saga story. However, we, all of us, have an incredible opportunity today, even alive today, when our own scientific technology has enabled us to take advantage of things like global positioning photography, ground penetrating radar, radar, and the ability to chemically examine the most minute quantities of residue in materials that have been underground for a thousand years to help us determine how Vikings live and particularly for today's program, how Vikings ate. Now, some of the most important sites which have given clues to us today about how Vikings ate, which they, what they ate, found the two burials which are depicted over on these two posters that we have here on the uh, west side of the room. The caved-in ship with the olive and the carved prow, that's the famous Osseberg Viking ship. Now, our ship, the Viking, was based on an earlier discovery from the year 1880, the ship which is called the Gokstad ship, the name of the farmer was found. The Osseberg ship was discovered in 1903, 20 some years later, and excavated in 1904. But it contained by far the richest variety of artifacts, including food residues of any discovery up to that date and time. In addition, that, that ship was buried with two females inside it, and our ability today to analyze their bone structure has given us important insights into the class that those two women belong to and what their diet consisted of. Now, the second, uh, second image you see there is a very, very famous burial. Uh, it was when first discovered in the early 1900s, uh, believed to be the burial of a gorgeous Viking warrior, male one that is. And this is from uh, the biggest Viking era cemetery we know, a place just a few miles from Stockholm in Sweden called Birka or Birka, good enough to say. Um, it was later discovered in this century that that skull is actually a woman. But there have been some 1,000 excavations uh, from the cemetery at Birka many of which contain cooking utensils or appliances, which again, give us insight into what the diet of the people at the time was. So this is why we're so fortunate to be alive here today at the time we live in, where our ability to scientifically examine these plants has given us insights that no prior generation has had the opportunity to be able to understand about how things live and how they eat today. And because of the advances which we have today, we know that, i give you a quick rundown. At the very least, because the, time, the, the list grows larger every day, Vikings had access to barley, we'll do it alphabetically, barley, beets, blackberries, beans, cabbage, cherries, coriander, cow parsley, crab apples, dill, emmer wheat, fennel, figs, linseed oil, grapes, kale, leeks, lingonberries, millet, oats, onions, peas, peaches, plums, Raspberries, mint, rye, spelt, savory, turnips, walnuts, wheat, and white 
carrots. That's today, maybe tomorrow. In summary, the, the Viking diet was varied and very healthy, sort of high in fats. But of course, people worked hard living in a cold climate, but it was low in sugar. And of course, obviously contained no artificially processed ingredients whatsoever. It's not unrealistic to say that the Viking diet across all social spectrums was probably the most healthy of its era. So now take a look at some of the specific foods that we have been prepared today, you know, photographs of them made from proven Viking ingredients. All right, and we're gonna start out with the kind of food that the two women, one about 50, one about 80, who were discovered in the Osterberg ship at the very highest of Viking social strata would have enjoyed. This is beef with a berry sauce. Now, during the Viking era, upper class Vikings, we'll call that class the Jarls, from which the English word, the Jarls ate more meat than most people. Viking protein, animal protein, was not meat at all, fish. And this included the farmers who lived along the coast. Of course, they butchered animals. But of course, butchering an animal requires an opportunity to consume it quickly. There's no refrigeration at this time period. And a large animal, for example, a cow, you know, the animal produces beef, would only be butchered if there was a large enough crowd around, an event large enough to support a larger crowd to be able to consume it because there's no effective way to preserve it. We can talk about drying, we can talk about smoking. These things all take time and an enormous amount of dedicated labor to do it. This is not something that an ordinary farmer living someplace on an isolated fjord is going to do to butcher a cow, the enormous work required to put all this meat up. So in the, toward the beginning of the Viking era, for the upper classes, mutton, land meat, was by, or, or sheep meat rather, mature sheep, was by far the most common, we'll call it red meat consumed. By the end of the Viking era, when Vikings upper class uh, members were at the height of their power and expansion, beef became the most common meat for the Viking upper classes. And the skeletal structure of the two women found with the Osterberg ship indicates that their diet was high in meat. And of course, a berry sauce that requires a whole army of people out in the woods looking around different kinds of berries, as well as somebody to cook this off. So this is not food for the common person. Cheese. There's never been any actual cheese or cheese residue discovered from any Viking site. However, we can figure it out. Um, it was known, for example, and so a couple of saga stories talk about uh, guests being served way the watery liquid that drains off of cheese when you make it, being served whey as a beverage. Well, you're not going to have whey as a beverage unless you're, unless you're making cheese. Uh, we do have saga references to cheese as well. So although there's never actual residue found of it. Uh, yeah. Now, we also give, get some idea about diet because cheese production requires access to rennet. Rennet is an enzyme found in the stomachs of juvenile milk drinking mammals. So in order to be able to access rennet for the purpose of cheese making, because the addition of rennet to milk begins the process of cheese production, this means also that small mammals, uh, cows, sheep, pigs, would be slaughtered to get access to the rennet. It's the only way to get that. So we know because cheese was produced, that in addition, these smaller animals were eaten but on occasion, a little rennet goes a long way. Now, cheese is one of those foods and one of the few foods that could also be used not only when you're at home, but also used for voyaging, right? It doesn't require any advanced preparation once you've got it. And to figure out, it, it, it's something of a puzzle to figure out what Vikings were able to eat on shipboard. They didn't build fires on board their Viking ships. Uh, the Viking ships themselves are made of flannel material, but they're also waterproof with highly flammable materials as well. Uh, our own ship is treated, for example, linseed oil, pine tar, and turpentine. All those are highly flammable. Imagine soaking your bike ship in then and then having a loose spark. But of course, a loose spark, as it comes from an open fire or even sparks coming out of a fire, 
would pose a threat to the sail as well, even more of a danger. So when Vikings are traveling, for example, they're going along a coastal way, uh, they would come ashore or send someone ashore to do cooking, but the crew would remain in the boat. And then once the food is prepared on shore, that would bring prepared food back to the ship. Now, if you're traveling across the Western Ocean, you're traveling from Norway to the Faroe Islands or to Iceland, from Iceland to Greenland, there's no opportunity to land along the way. And so in shipboard conditions like that, you're going to be limited to food that doesn't require preparation in any way. Uh, and cheese is an example of that. So we can be sure that Leif Erikson ate cheese on his way from Greenland to the New World. Crab apples, mentioned on my list I ran through just a moment ago. Crab apples were actually found in the Osseberg ship. Imagine that. Apples a thousand years old, and we know what they are, we find a good time to be alive. And only one of a variety of fruits that were available to the well-balanced like diet. And of course, a kind of food that's accessible to all classes. And of course, and need to have line of voyage as well, right? You don't require any preparation. Just try to keep a little bit dry if you can, a little bit wet to make a difference. Try to keep the worms on, of course. But, you know, they're good for weeks uh, on long voyages. We can be sure, once again, that uh, this would be a food that likes to eat not only at home, but also steak. Barley bread from Burka. I like the alliteration now. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, it turns out that barley was by far the most common grain in my times, at least based on what's discovered with burials. Um, and interestingly enough, it's not baked in ovens. Uh, there have been Viking era ovens discovered, but most Viking era bread based on finds is what we call a pan bread, pancake, compared to pan rather than oven. Now, that doesn't mean it's not, it's, it's un unleavened. It's not unleavened. Uh, Vikings would use yeast from their brewing. You say they use it, but the Viking times use the same yeast from brewing uh, added to bread mixture to help it rise a little bit. But again, not baked in ovens, rather baked in pans. But this is a recreation of a Viking era instrument. I bought this from the guy who uh, runs a group called Wareham Forge, and they produce Viking era replicas for Parks Canada for their site at Lonzo Meadows in Canada, Lake Erickson's landing site. So this, as far as I know, this is the only copy of this in the United States of America. So here it is right in front of you, <laughs> copying the Viking era quick pan the kind would have produced the bread you're looking at on the screen. An example of food that could only possibly be eaten on a voyage because it's got to be warm. Uh, but this is the kind of fare when red meat in some body is eaten by common people you would find. Um, this particular stew is made of lamb bone broken for their marrow with turnips, the other most common Viking vegetable, right? If barley is the most common Viking grain, turnips are the most common Viking vegetable. And uh, this is an example of food for ordinary. Remember, we had to kill the lamb in order to get the bread from its stomach to start the process of producing the cheese. Well, here's, here's what happens with the rest of the lamb. Yes, it is what it says it is. And this is based on residue, which is found inside a burial from Burka. Um, the residue was oat based as far as the grain, but there was an unusually high protein content to this bread residue that was found with very little fat content. Now, when bread, you're making bread, you have to have some ingredient to add moisture to the mix, but it's got to be something that has some body to it, right? Usually it's a kind of oil, but this particular example indicates that an ingredient in the bread was blood. Now, blood is normally a waste product from butchering, but I'm sure some practical mind Viking said, well, why let it just run away? <laughs> and the result, of course, is a highly nutritious bread product uh, providing calories, 
carbohydrates as well as protein. Sorry to spoil your lunch. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just shoot right past this. All right. Now, in terms of common eaten meat, um, more common than red meat is chicken. And why chicken is the ideal size for one meal, right? There's no process required to preserve chicken meat for some future consumption event as you have to do with a larger butchered animal. And so the most common meat by Vikings uh, who aren't or who got, who've gotten past the seafood stage uh, would be related to chickens. And, and chickens an example also of an animal that could be brought on a voyage and consumed as long as there was a chance on the particular voyage you're on to be able to land and cook on shore, as they discussed earlier, and then bring the cooked thing back to the ship because you're not going to cook chicken on board the ship. But chickens will signal preserve just fine. Even when it gets away, you got no place to fly to. You got to get right back to the ship. So you can let them run around. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> um, but anyway, but so chicken is an item that would be eaten by all classes of uh, the Jarls, the bosses, the Karls, individual landowners, and the thralls, their slaves as well. A lot of chicken consumed in the Viking world. And there it is, the fundamental core Viking vegetable. Um, turnips were to the Vikings as potatoes were to century Irish. However, we have no evidence of a turnip crop failure. Uh, at any rate, uh, and this is nothing more than a turnip quite literally thrown into the fire. This is a great way, for example, for a young Viking homemaker to be taught by her mother uh, how to tend the fire because all you have to do is poke it occasionally with a stick to keep it rolling around in the fire. Uh, there is the, the there, there is sugar, of course, uh, in the turnip, and that's caramelized with the process of cooking like this in coals. So it has a good flavor to it. I've tried it. Um, but at any rate, this we have to assume a very, very common Viking food consumed by all classes. Uh, presumably, you could even enjoy this not warm, but cold, but still cooked uh, on a Viking voyage for a matter of several weeks before it would go bad. Um, and once again, of course, if you have a chance to come ashore to roast, you can enjoy it warm, but it's a food that can be taken on long voyages. And after all, you have to have something to eat when you get wherever you're going as well. So turnips are perfect for long-term storage. But one of the cornerstones of the Viking diet for all classes, but especially for the poorer classes, and remember, not everybody is a farmer in the Viking era as well. There's crass people. There's major, major trading centers. The people living in major trading centers are always living along the seacoast, right? And the core protein for their diet is going to be protein from fish. And of those, herring is at the absolute top of the list. Of course, herring are migratory fish. And they arrive in Scandinavia between September and October of the year. Um, and they're dried, smoked, or salted in huge numbers and eaten over the winter, as well as eaten fresh. And the Viking civilization really depended upon this gift of the annual migration of the herring to keep people fed over the winter time. Now, of course, winter is also or the fall, rather, late fall, is we also at the same time, time we, we butcher larger animals uh, and preserve and salt and smoke their meat. But uh, dried herring were simply a state of the Viking diet, and dried, smoked, or salted also provided food then that could be used on voyages when there was no chance to come ashore and prepare food. But as you can see, we have a pretty good varied diet going either for, even for seafaring Vikings, right? We've got, uh, we've got herring, we've got apples, right? We've got parsnips, we've got turnips, carrots, as well as other fruits and berries. All right. Now, mussels are a very interesting example of how food tastes change uh, over time. And the same thing happens to us. I mean, you know, all of us are quite used to eating, for example, turkey or chicken as an alternative to beef. But 150 years ago, duck and goose were also on our regular diets. But how many people here today within the last three days, oh heck, within the last year, have eaten a goose or a duck, <laughs> maybe the Chinese restaurant 
Why not? Right? Food tastes just change and not necessarily for any particular good reason. There are fashion foods. And today, for us, for no particular good reason, chicken and turkey are fashionable, but ducks and geese are not. Of course, there are plenty of places in the world where they still are. And the same thing happened in the Viking world. In sea coast middens, middens are, are scrap heaps. In the pre-Viking era, huge numbers of mussel shells are found. They were part of the normal diet in Scandinavia. For reasons which are completely unknown, mussels fell out of style in the Viking countries. Although they remain on the diet in France and would someday be Belgium, someday be Holland. And then as Viking colonialization expanded out of the Scandinavian homeland into Ireland, into York and England, mussels came back in the diet. And so from Viking finds in those locations out of the Scandinavian homelands, we once again in Viking trash pits find large numbers of mussels. A Viking era food fad. Now, this is one fascinating topic. Hazelnut honey patties. Now, these are not fake. They're simply smushed together and allowed to dry. And you learned it here today. Dessert is good for you. Cookies are good for you. But as it turns out, the formula or formulation of putting together hazelnut and honey has nothing to do with the delicious dessert, although in fact it is. Rather, this mixture was found in a medieval Swedish source of folk remedies to treat coughs. Now, there's nothing new about either honey or oils being used to soothe cough. Hazelnut oil had long been a folk remedy for reducing inflammation. It slightly constricts, constricts skin as well, which means that it is helpful to throat tissue that's been irritated and roughened by coughing. All right. Now, hazel is the only wild nut found in Scandinavia, and it's found in all Viking burial sites, very, very commonly consumed. They also have up to 56% oil content in the nuts, which means if you grind them up, they're just oozing oil. Similarly, honey is a long established Viking folk remedy. It was believed by Vikings to enhance their physical strength, but there is solid scientific basis for Vikings' healthiness as well. Uh, at the, the, uh, at the basis level, um, ingestion of honey produces hydrogen peroxide. It also serves to desiccate bacteria, right, because of the sugar content. For that reason, it is effectively an antibiotic, but it also coats damaged tissue that's been damaged by coughing. So both hazelnut and its oils, foliated oils, as well as honey were effective and remain today effective treatment. The fact that it made a really good dessert is only secondary, but never forget you learned here today, dessert is good for you. Yellow pea. Still today by tradition eaten in Sweden on Thursday night, split pea soup. Uh, peas were definitely on the Viking eye diet and they're found everywhere in Viking burials and residue in cooking here. Now, um, of course, they're softened by soaking and cooking, but they're ideal for for storage. So you've got something when you get there. Yes, you can cook them. You can't just eat them as they are dry. But if you have time to land, it allows for this. Uh, this is something fairly quickly, you can begin soaking in water, of course, during the voyage, 
All you have to do is go short and warm them up for their soup. Otherwise, they have to stay inside and have something to eat to get wherever you're going. But of course, they're commonly at home as well. And we know because they're found widespread throughout the Viking era, the Viking areas rather, it's a very, very commonly soup. And of course, highly nutritious as well. Now, what about split pea soup with ham? One of the classics of all times, uh, certainly eaten by the uh, by the French Canadians in the 1500s up in Canada. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> Obviously, the Vikings ate pork. Uh, pork, by the way, is fairly far down the list of Viking meats. Uh, both mutton and beef or pork in terms of the quantities, as far as the bones discovered in ash heaps tell the story. So we don't know for sure if Vikings had pea soup with ham stock in it or not, but there's no reason why they would not have. Fundamental of the Viking diet as herring is stockfish. And stockfish are, 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 are air dried fish. Uh, the most common species of this, of course, is codfish, although it doesn't have to be codfish. Uh, could also be pollock or haddock. Um, and they arrive in the springtime, just about the time you're really sick of eating herring, along come the cod. So again, timing is everything. And although they can be uh, uh, smoked or salted, uh, in the Viking era, by far the most common way of preparing them was simply cut them over, take the heads off, take out the internal organs, leave the bones in. Otherwise, the whole thing curls into a mass and hang them out to dry. And you've got then fish that can be preserved for months, indeed even years, although I wouldn't have the guts to try one of the several years old. But at any rate, uh, this is what dried stockfish looks like. So the term stockfish doesn't refer to a species. It refers to food preparation method, which means it's been air dried. Now, of course, this is ready to go for long sea voyages. Um, pretty darn tough to chew when it's been dried up to the consistency of bark. But it's important to remember that um, both these fishes, herring as well as cod, have a fairly high oil content as well. And that oil is trapped inside the fish. Now, one of the things that could, and <laughs> could be done and was done in the Viking era uh, to bring stockfish back to life is to wrap it in cloth and beat the heck out of it for hours. And what, the, what is accomplished by doing this, first of all, it sort of separates the bones out of the mess, but it also sorts of reconstitutes the oil and tissue mixture in the fish to create kind of a spread, which you can eat with your fingers as is, or smear it on some of that handmade bread that you brought on <laughs> your voyage. So you have like a little fishy cracker to eat. And again, very highly nutritious. It's good, good for you. Um, it's going to stink, of course. <laughs> there's no way around that problem. Uh, you know, there's always lots of jokes about lutefisk. Well, this is like you know a step before that. Um, at any rate, but this is a staple, certainly available for Viking sea voyages. We can be sure that Leif Erikson and his crew and everybody else's crew uh, and their long voyages across the North Atlantic ate plenty of air-dried codfish, either as is or reconstituted in some method. They go ashore, then they would chop them to pieces, put them back to water, let it soak up water again, become sort of soft, still kind of chewy. But, uh, or just as I talked about, we had hours with nothing else to do other than watch the sail fill, pounding away on, on the stock fish to produce this sort of spread that you could then eat with your fingers or spread on something else to eat. And as I said, the stock fish had arrives just about the time you're tired of eating herring. They arrive in the Scandinavian waters. They can actually come down to the Barents Sea from the far north side of uh, Norway. And they come down the coast of Norway and then into the Danish and Swedish waters. And they get there in the early springtime, just about the time you're tired. All right, well, you've had a lot to eat here now, so we're gonna wash it all down. <laughs> and we'll talk about booze. Not that, which these guys are clearly well familiar. Um, now, the Vikings, as far as we know, did not possess knowledge of distillation. Although into the Viking era, uh, we do know that at this time period, uh, vodka was being produced in Russia, and and whiskey was likely produced in Scott in, in Ireland. Not by them, but by people who were already there. But the basic Viking drinks that we know they drank uh, were mead and ale. Now, mead is a luxury beverage. Uh, 
meat is made approximately of 20%, 25% honey to 75% water, which means to get a decent drinkable quantity for a big party, we're talking about an enormous amount of honey. And honeybees can't survive in Scandinavia, except in the very, very southern most portion. So honey, by and large, is obtained in Viking countries through trade. And you have to have a huge amount of honey to produce a decent quantity of meat. So as a result, meat is really a beverage for the upper classes. Um, it's not much in it. 75% water, 25% honey and yeast. And the yeast uh, could come from whatever source you've got. And this can come out of brewing beer, or brewing ale rather, uh, the most common source of yeast, the same yeast that is used in bread making. Um, but a honey, or excuse me, meat could be flavored of rose hips, for example. We actually have excavated uh, residue from mead with traces of rose hips in it for additional flavoring. So by far the most common beverage for the masses was not mead, but was rather Viking-made ale. And once again, barley, the most common Viking grain, was the principal ingredient, although we do know they added hops for flavor, just like you would make beer making today. Now, after about a week of these ingredients sitting together, uh, the yeast would begin to rise from the top. That yeast would then be scooped off and used in baking or to start another batch of ale. Um, the alcohol content was much lower in Viking era uh, ale than in commercial products today, and certainly much lower uh, than in mead. Uh, mead could be up to, believe it or not, up to 20% alcohol. She puts it, puts it almost in the fortified wine range. Um, Viking ale, on the other hand, is in the two and a half to five percent range. Um, it actually wasn't necessarily uh, high enough in alcohol content to be able to kill bacteria that was in the beer uh, in, or the ale. It would prevent the growth of additional bacteria, but not necessarily kill what was already there. So um, if your idea of a good beer is a ice cold muralite after cutting the grass in August, you would not like the flavor of Viking, of Viking era ale. Um, exposure to air oxidizes the flavor ingredients in ale. And there was never a time when Viking era ale was not exposed to the air. So we would consider the taste of Viking era <coughs> uh, ale to be utterly disgusting. It would taste rancid, but it was better than water. And hence, these fellows here are enjoying their time with their Viking era beer, not knowing of anything better than this. Uh, what about Viking assumption of wine? Well, we do know that during the Viking era, uh, Scandinavia, all of Northern Europe, was warmer than it is today. And wine grapes grew in England. We also have, you got to love where we are in the state of science today, we also have traces of grapes from Scandinavia. Earlier on, I talked about just how little amount of material you need to determine what it is with today's scientific methods. But we know, we know that Vikings knew what grapes were and used grapes because of an excavation in Hedeby. Hedeby is now in Germany, but in the Viking era was in Denmark. And there have been discovered at a grave in Hedeby two grape seeds. <laughs> but those two grape seeds are all you need to know that, in fact, grapes were known to the Vikings. Um, but in terms of the quantity produced, wine would probably be even less really consumed than mead, and mead was already a beverage for the upper classes. I should point out, though, by the way, that... Um, some very important figures in Viking history did enjoy mead. Uh, this would include uh, Odin, uh, the Viking principal god, who uh, exists, according to the legends, only on mead. That's all he ever consumes. The name Odin uh, in the Old Norse language uh, means uh, either enlightened or crazy uh, or inspired, clearly altered, perhaps as a result of his diet. We also know that. If you fall in battle with a weapon in your hand and are killed by injury, die in the battlefield, whether it's not a mistake or something, 
you'll go off to either Valhalla run by Odin or by the alternative Viking paradise run by, yes, our new Viking name, right? Of <clears throat> where you will be served by a Valhalla, a horn of mead to welcome you. And you will spend every night in eternity until the great valley of time, Ragnarok, drinking mead. So mead is highly important in Viking mythology as well. Which raises an interesting question. Um, what exactly was intoxication to the Vikings? Well, we think that they believed that intoxication was a kind of a, a, a intellectually, emotionally exalted state. Um, because intoxication was part of some of the most important ceremonies in Viking life. Um, we know from a traveling Muslim scholar who witnessed a Viking funeral uh, in Eastern Europe that for everybody involved in the funeral to become intoxicated was part of the event. I guess who's more emotional than someone who's intoxicated? We also know that in Viking weddings, it was expected that both bride and groom would get staggeringly drunk as part of the process. We also know that especially at the midwinter celebration, the winter solstice celebration, intoxication in mandatorily specified quantities of beverage you had to drink during the celebrations was important because an and a part of the a part of the ceremony was vows for the new year of things you were due. And these vows, which were made under the influence of intoxication, were believed to be sacred vows. Indeed, one could forfeit one's life for having made a vow and not carrying it out for a vow that was made at the time of the winter solstice. So rather than uh, the view that we would have today of public intoxication as being a dis disgraceful thing, Vikings believed that the state of intoxication clearly being enjoyed by these fellows here is really an excited, exalted, higher you know, emotional and spiritual state during which you have a closer access to divinity than you do under normal conditions. Really bizarre. Um, Vikings ate two meals a day, by the way, uh, one late morning, one early evening, a snack, for example, would be some milk product of the day for real hungry. But what if there were no meals? I recently come upon a fascinating uh, article by a PhD candidate. Uh, her name is Tania Jackson. She's a Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. And she has a clue as to what brought about the beginning of the Viking era. Now, for a long time, we've dated the beginning of the Viking era when Vikings left their homelands and began their raiding and trading for distant areas uh, with the Viking raid on the Lindisfarne Marnes, excuse me, Lindisfarne Monastery in England, which took place in 793 AD. Why then? Why not a few years later or a few years before that? Why then? Well, part of it may have to do with uh, Charlemagne. Uh, we do know that in 782, going on 10 years earlier, uh, Charlemagne had destroyed an important pagan shrine, took 4,500 captives, um, converted them all to Christianity by baptizing them all. And then executed them. In other words, Char Charlemagne was a terrible missionary for the for the for the for the Christian values uh, that they were trying to spread. But even that took place ten years earlier. Why seven ninety three? Well, what Doctor To Be Jackson has discovered is that between seven ninety one and seven ninety four, there was a drought all over Northern Europe, and in fact, the same source that describes the Viking raid on the Lindisfarne Monastery specifically mentions in its list of disasters that had befallen in Northern England a widespread famine that was then followed by the Viking raid on Lindisfarne. Now, we also know that among the Viking festivals was a festival to honor our new head and tail, Freya and her brother Friar. Freya and Friar were the gods and goddesses of rain, 
in the case of the brother, and fertility in the case of Freya. And the new Christian faith said those gods didn't even exist. And the next thing that happens is a drought comes. What Dr. Jackson is suggesting is that the intriguing event for the beginning of the Viking era was a famine in Northern Europe to which the Vikings retaliated by defending the honor of their gods and goddesses. As they say, was for thought. I have a pass around, show and tell if you take a look at. The first here is what Vikings had preserved things like butter and cheese in the Viking environment. Now, I actually got this from the gift box right around the corner, so here's a free commercial to them. <laughs> uh, and for a long, long time, the, the owner of the shop made a point of going to Scandinavia and bringing back uh, objects that really depict the life, depict the life in the old country. Now, this actual example really comes from the mid-19th century, but it might as well come from the mid-9th century because it's absolutely identical to what's been found in the Viking era graves, all right? We all, thanks to these fellows here, we don't know what this is for, right? Now, notice there's no way to stand this thing up. Why? Well, it's like a cocktail party. Once it's filled, you just keep walking around, right? No need to put it down until you fall down, right? So there's no way to stand this up, but we know these are found in Viking burials all over the place, drinking horns, because once it's filled, you just keep walking around as long as you can walk. This is a fascinating piece of Viking cookware. Uh, there have been multiple examples of these that have been discovered in Viking burial sites. What this is for is for grilling a small piece of meat or fish, right? So it doesn't matter if you like Burger King or McDonald's better, you have both with this, right? Because this device will both sear the meat and also let the heat come through, create a beautiful design of a piece of meat or fish once you finish cooking it. And just this very morning, I picked this piece up just a few hours ago. I'm going to walk around with this, and I want you to note the construction of this, because it is the crude construction of Viking-era cookware, which has allowed us to understand what the Vikings ate. The Vikings had, did not have the technological ability to be able to pound a gigantic piece of stainless steel into a saucepan shape. Right? This requires enormous presses. So instead, the Viking blacksmith had to assemble a pot by assembling small sections and riveting together. This resulted in an abundance of nooks and crannies. Way to be discovered by us today with our ability to analyze the new method trapped inside. And so, are there any questions? Yes. That ship. Well, uh, the uh, the Osberg ship. Sure. Yes. Huh? Oh no, it's very deliberately buried. In fact, the process which was buried was absolutely fascinating. Um, it wasn't all buried at one time. Uh, the it was it was dragged up to where it was placed. Then the, uh, uh, the there was a kind of a little bed chamber that was put inside. The two females were buried side by side in the same bed. Uh, there were other than sacrificed animals went in there as well. And then part of the ship was buried and part left unburied. So it appears that the, uh, the funeral process went on for a long time. And for a long time, you could go stand on the deck where 15 feet away, these two dead bodies just are in the bed from where you are. And then at a later date, 
the rest of the ship was buried. But no, it didn't wash up. It was a very deliberate burial with a lot, a lot of uh, a lot of symbolism and ceremony went along with that. No, there was right. That's the well, and a lot of animals too. There were horses and there were okay. dogs. Right. Any other questions? Yes. Um, great menu. Life expectancy. Life expectancy. You know, it's hard to say. I mean, the the I mean, first of all, the the ideal Viking life was to not live a long life. The object was to get killed in battle and get off to Valhalla, uh, and then. Um, but it's I guess it's important to keep in mind. You know, the the, the well fed women who were buried in the Rossberg ship. One was about fifty. One was about eighty. All right. Uh, the um, the skeleton from this woman here, who's in the the. the Upright close to the right, the one from Birka. Uh, she's in their 40s. Um, so it, it's very hard to say. I mean, we do know that a lot of women died in childbirth, a lot of infants died. I mean, it's all been through all through history, you know, the first year or two of life. Um, so I I'm very reluctant to talk about what life expectancy was like because there's so many natural ways to die that are part of life life. Like I I would be reluctant to guess on that. Yes. Oh yes, what is it? Uh, I don't know about you know, in terms of type of hops that's used. I don't know. I don't have the detail on type of body. I do know uh, hops has certainly been discovered as a flavoring, but I, I don't know which type of hops. Speaking of food, many Vikings die, but the fish thrown in this. <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't know of any, but I suppose, I, I mean, there certainly isn't. It's a good question because the, the stock fish is prepared by leaving the bones inside that's important yeah. to keep the shape because I mean, you see it curl up into the wall with a little bit of snake. Um, and, and the preparation process of pounding is supposed to Bones out. Not to keep your lookout for the well. Obviously, if you're up, you're also get a lot of little broken bones inside of that. Um, so it's probably a safe bet to say that certainly people got push bones. Up, but it would have had to happen. Yes. I don't know. I also we're talking about salty food, um, air drying and smoking, all that. Right, but I don't. I don't know. I don't know if I use where, where they had like salt pans, for example. I mean, the source would have been dehydrating seawater, but I don't. I don't know where that was done. Anyone else? Well, it, it, so it would have it would have had to be contained in, held in some some kind of container because of the risk uh, from from mites, right? Um, but I don't know what long term like I mean, something like this is not going to hold us in this body of, of any of anything. Uh, but I don't know what type of sacks they use for long term storage of grains. I don't. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming today. Then. Don't